See, this is really indicative of a lot of problems that we have in that initially when we came in here, the Muslims were all spread out as far away from each other as they could possibly get. Only ones that were sitting next to each other were people who were sitting next to their friends, all right? Yet we we're one Oma, except, well, I'm going to be over here and, and I'll be with my friends over here and we'll ignore the ones over here and we'll ignore the ones over there, right? So now then, most of you anyway are much, much closer and uh, we're gonna talk about one Oma to a point but actually what I had already told everyone that I was going to talk about was, again, taqwa. Uh, that's, again, getting to know Allah, know who Allah is, and understand Allah. Uh, it's dawa. It's learning how to present Islam to people. It's um, learning how to, to make one ummah through recognizing your own connection with the creator of the universe. Um, over the years, I've, <coughs> I've had many professions and had many opportunities to learn new ways of presenting things. And um, I'm, I'm not a, a great leader or a great scholar or a great much of anything, um, except I think I'm a pretty good mother. <coughs> I think I do tolerably well at that. Uh, but still I keep getting asked to come out and talk about Islam to different groups. Um, sometimes the groups are a little complicated because I know that they're hostile from the beginning and trying to find a way to present Islam is delicate because if you present Islam wrong to people, then you make enemies of them. And since I attempt to be, if you will, an ambassador of Islam, when I'm going into these groups of people trying to give a positive image of Islam to implant in them a hunger and a desire to learn more about Islam, then my approach becomes very important besides being very personalized for each group. I was asked to come and speak to the League of, of uh, Women Voters, which is a very powerful women's organization. These are all women who are very highly educated. They're activists within their community. They're political, politically active. Uh, most of them are in you know, top positions in, in corporations or, or businesses. So you know, these, are, these are women that you have to be able to approach on an intellectual and still a very highly spiritual way. And I kept asking Allah for guidance. How am I going to talk to these women? I was intimidated by them. Um, some of them had more education than I did. Most of them have about the same amount of education that I do. Uh, but still, they were in positions of power which I've never liked being in. So I'm asking Allah for guidance, and usually when I'm really trying to find a way to do something like this, I put myself in an environment where everything around me is created by Allah rather than created by man. Um, because when we're surrounded by concrete and buildings and glass and metal and all of this stuff, then, then we're surrounded by what we consider to be the power of man. And it's hard to make that, break through that connection to find the power of Allah, at least for me, being surrounded by that which is made by Allah assists me in making that transition. So I have a favorite uh, bike trail, and I look for the bike trails because they are accessible to wheels, and wheels are my way of getting around. Uh, and there's the little Miami bike trail up in Ohio, so I went up there and, and was wheeling along the, the trail, making dua that Allah would guide my tongue and help me to find a way to approach these women that they would be able then to assist us in some of the efforts that we were making and that maybe, inshallah, some of their hearts would be moved to Islam. As I was wheeling along, deep in thought, deep in dua, okay, my wheelchair hit a rock. It hit this rock. Now, the interesting thing about when your wheelchair hits a rock, the wheelchair stops, the body within continues on because we are already traveling at a high speed and, and I don't have a safety belt on. So the wheelchair stopped and I went forward and I'm laying on the ground with my knees skinned up and my elbows skinned up and my immediate reaction was, great, you know, I'm asking for help and I hit a rock. 
I'm human. All right. I get upset. Um, and then I thought, you know, stop for law. They, I'm asking Allah for help, for guidance. And Allah puts this rock here, and I would question the guidance that he's chosen for me. And so I realized that the, the truth of it was that Islam is like this rock. Most people, if they saw this rock, would not give it a second glance. Most people, if they are presented with Islam, will not give it a second glance. Most people, if they saw this rock, would not consider taking it home, examining it, learning anything about it. If it got in their way, they'd push it aside. Most people are not interested in examining Islam for what it contains within. If the Muslims get in the way, they'll push us aside. But Islam is very much like this rock. Because the deeper you look into it, the more magnificence you will find, the more beauty, the more wonder, the complexities that will delight the mind and eye are all within Islam. So I had my opening. Looking within the rock, you discover that which you never imagined would be. Looking within Islam, people also discover that which they would never imagine to be. And it's up to us to try and make that possible. But we have to make it possible within ourselves as well, because we do not always know what Islam has to offer. And so we look and we find difficulties in our path. We find trouble in our path. We find insurmountable odds within our path. And we don't examine and see what it is that we can gain from that experience. And yet within every difficulty, within every problem that Allah places before us, there is a benefit, there is a beauty, there is a process that will, will help us to grow and to develop in ways that far exceed what we would have imagined before. As we're dealing with life, a lot of things happen to us sometimes that are very distressing. You know, we'll, we'll be faced with illness, we'll be faced with um, financial loss or loss of prestige or a lot of different things like that. And we will feel sorry for ourselves and we'll complain about them. But if we actually are reading the Quran and Sunnah, we know that anything and everything that happens to us has within it a benefit. And rather than complaining about the ugliness that we are now hit with, with the hardness that we are now hit with, we need to examine deep inside and see what the experience has to bring to us, to offer to us. Because you may discover that that experience is the greatest experience that you will ever have had. You know, for those of you that read the little book, when I talk about my experience with cancer, terminal cancer, that it was the greatest gift that Allah ever gave to me up to this date. I have no doubt that there are greater gifts that are beyond my wildest imagination. And yet, the knowledge that everything that happens to us is to our benefit. There's something within it that will help us, will make us better, will make our lives better, help me to benefit from the gifts that Allah was offering. If I hadn't had that knowledge, then I might have felt sorry for myself. I might have been angry. I might have been distressed or disturbed. And see, in our ignorance, our failure to understand what Allah has to offer us, we separate ourselves from Him, and we separate ourselves from each other. Allah says that we are one Ummah. He has made us one Ummah. There's one God, one Ummah, one community. And we should be coming together, ignoring our cultural backgrounds, ignoring race, ignoring languages, overcoming those things that would separate us, those things that would make us different, and finding that which brings us to the oneness, which is the fact that we are all created 
by the creator of the universe and that he has provided us guidance that will assist us through our life to become the very best human being we could possibly be. The guidance that will assure us of holding the highest place in the hereafter as well. But we separate ourselves from Allah. We don't know what Allah has to say. We wait for someone else to tell us what it is that we are supposed to believe, what it is that we are supposed to do. We go through a lot of the physical actions without allowing ourselves to be moved in the heart, without letting us to, ourselves to have the, the spiritual relationship with the creator of the universe that is supposed to exist. And so instead our minds are filled with suspicion our minds are filled with pain. Our minds are filled with fear. But we are one Ummah. We have one God. His message is for all of humanity. His message has so much for us, if we would but look at it. When I use the rocks for teaching people about Islam, and I use them for teaching non-Muslims, as well as teaching Muslims, and especially in working with the youth. Because sometimes people need to see examples. And I think the rocks really show it, and some of them you'll have to come up and see a little bit later. But one of the attributes of the creator of the universe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that he is the preserver. And this is a, a great comfort to us because it tells us that nothing we ever do will be lost. On the day of judgment, every good deed, every good thought, every good intention, every good hope, we get credit for. It. And Allah knows what no one else does. So if you get recognition within this life or not, it's not important. What's important is that Allah is the preserver, and since He's also the judge, He's also the reckoner. Then the fact that he preserves everything is very important. But something that goes along with the knowledge that he's the preserver, is that there's a hadith that says that when somebody intends to do a bad thing, the angel hesitates and doesn't write it until the person does the bad thing. And then it's written as one bad deed. And yet if a person intends to do something that is good, the angel rushes to write it. Immediately, it's written as a good deed just by thinking that you would like to do it. You get credit for it. And then if you actually do it, you get credit of 7 to 70 to 700 times. So you see the way Allah preserves the good and preserves the opportunity. Well, these stones actually show that, and the only way you're going to see them is to come up here and look at them. Um, that these are fossils. These are ferns that were in, in uh, mud and over a period of time hardened to, to stone. And you can still see the ferns. And it looks like it was tiny little paintings, very delicate, painted with one hair. <laughs> they call it scrimshaw. Um, scenic pictures. They're beautiful little forest scenes which have, this one has a sunset in it, as well as a little river, um, and just, they're, they're, they're very beautiful. But they remind you that Allah is the preserver, and it reminds us how lucky we are on that. Uh, I have another example of that that I use, the, the bag that I carry, okay? I call it my teaching bag. Uh, and I have within it, I have stones which give me an opportunity because people will stop and ask me about this stone or that stone and it gives me an opportunity to share Islam. I take every, every way I can to give people an opportunity to ask me about Islam so I can share it. And when people see the beautiful stones dangling from my bag, they always ask me, well, what is that? And then I can start sharing with them a little bit about Islam. And, and the stones here, most of them you will have to come down and say, um, but there's one here that this this one is called a, a moss agate. And it used to actually be 
moss in water, and over time, even the minerals in the water harden to make stone, and so it, it still looks like it's moss in water when you look through it. Um, but again, Allah is the preserver, and He's preserved all of these for all times for us. You, it can remind you, it can assure you that there's no way that anything you ever do will be lost because Allah will not permit it. He's the preserver, and we know He's infallible, and He never misses a beat. And that should give us a lot of courage and a lot of strength because it frees us from the dependency upon the approval of man or the recognition of man. Because when you recognize that the approval of man or the recognition of man is not the thing that's going to get you into heaven, then you become free to act and react as Allah has ordered. And that's very important. Because a lot of times we're afraid to do things, we're afraid to make changes, we're afraid to interact in, in different ways because we need so much to have the approval of man. Okay? It, it, the approval of man is not what's going to get you into heaven. Um, now remember that you're not allowed to go out and intentionally hurt someone or do someone any injury. That, that's not acceptable. That would destroy an Uma very quickly. I was searching in the bag for what I call my patience rock. This is a very important, remember, we ask for patience all the time. Well, this little rock has a hole that goes all the way through it. And it was made by the steady drip of water. One dro drop of water at a time, finally wearing a hole all the way through the rock. And this rock reminds me that Allah is... Asabur. He is the patient. And I am so glad that he's patient. Because I need his patience. I make a lot of mistakes. I'm a little bit slow on, on a lot of things. I'm a little on the stubborn side. Um, you know, I, I need him to be patient with me. And knowing that he's patient and tolerant... <laughs> It, it makes it possible for me to continue growing and, and to hold out hope for myself. But it also reminds me to be patient with everyone else. <coughs> to give them time to grow. To give them time to develop. And not to expect that they would develop just in the way that I would envision. But to develop in the very best of way. By helping them to understand who their creator is. So this is my little patience rock. Why do I talk so much about the attributes of Allah? Because you need to know Allah. He is your creator. It is his guidance that we are supposed to be following. You know, when we try to convince our children to be Muslim, there's only so much that you can do with threats of fear of punishment. But if we teach our children about Allah, if we teach ourselves about Allah, then the submission to Allah becomes second nature. Because when you discover Allah's love, Allah's mercy, Allah is your protecting friend, when you understand what each one of these attributes means, you cannot help but feel love growing inside of you for Allah. And remember, if you love Allah, a grain of sand, He loves you, the ocean. If you take one step to Allah, He comes running to you. We deny ourselves so much because we don't know our Creator. We don't understand His attributes. I can't explain all of them here today. There's not enough time. But I hope to trigger something in you to make you start looking at the attributes a little bit more. Okay, So I'm going to cover as many as I can. Another one of Allah's attributes is that He is the shaper of beauty. He's the shaper of perfection. And sometimes we don't see the beauty that He's put within us. And there is indeed a beauty within each and every one of us. And that beauty is deeply buried because 
we don't look at ourselves and we don't even let people to see the true us because we somehow think that that we're not worthy, that we're not good enough, that we won't be acceptable. And say, so when you know that Allah is the one that makes that choice, then you don't have to worry so much and you're able to just go ahead and be you. Because it's not so important whether the man likes you or not. I'm saying man is in mankind. Okay? Well, Allah is the shaper of beauty. And by the way, these rocks, these have not been altered by my hand or anyone else's hand. This is just the way they come. And Allah shapes things in the way that he sees best. He doesn't alter from the perfection that he is creating. And whether we understand or even see the perfection that Allah has made, the perfection is there. And if we begin to look for that perfection, you will find it. In each of us, there is a level of beauty that should be apparent to our brothers and sisters. And that beauty again comes from the knowledge of Allah that teaches us how to be the best possible person. The shapes of the stones have another characteristic that's very important to me. And that is that the Quran speaks of the fact that even the stone submits to Allah, the stone bounds to, bows to Allah. You all know that. You've heard it. You've repeated it so many times. But I'm wondering how many of you actually understand it. See, when Allah tells this stone, you are appetite then the stone will only form in certain shapes. It'll always be the same shape. No matter if it's big or little, it'll still form only in the shape that was set by Allah. So we have the appetite here. And then we have uh, topaz, which again will only take a specific shape. Or you could look again this one is called Argonaut, and it has a lot of different crystals of different sizes, which is why I carry it. Because again, as you look at it, you can see that every one of them formed in exactly the shape that was ordered by Allah. The stone does not deviate from what Allah has ordered. Allah had ordered the stone be formed in this shape, and the stone forms this shape. It does not deviate. The stone has the knowledge of Allah's power and recognizes Allah's power. The stone recognizes Allah's might. It recognizes Allah's wisdom. And it submits to the form that Allah has chosen for it. Allah has chosen for us to be one Ummah. And yet we have not submitted to that. We will still find ways of dividing ourselves, of separating ourselves. We will invent excuses if we can't find something. But we will keep ourselves separate. We always think that we know better than someone else or that we understand deeper than someone else and we don't listen to the other person. We try to see to our needs or what we perceive to be as everyone else's needs. And those things help to divide us more. We tend to cling to those who speak the same language or wear the same dress or have the same cultural background. And again, they divide our oma. This doesn't mean that you give up your cultural identity or that you give up your language. No. But it means that you place Allah's will above everything. It means that you live Islam first. No matter what else is going on, you will react to it in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered. Because if you react to it in that way, then the results will be better. You remember that you are to be proactive and make a difference, that you change things. 
and that you have the wisdom to recognize what can be changed or what should be changed. Allah gives the guidance about how to change injustices. He shows us how to walk the path of life. But the only way you learn this is by turning to Allah. You need to know who He is, to see His true magnificence. In discovering His magnificence, you will also discover the magnificence of the Qur'an, the infallibility of the Qur'an. You will discover the beauty of the Hadith, and you will begin to see how important it is to your happiness, to your very survival, and to the survival of all of humanity. Everything we do must be done in the way of Quran and Sunnah, even to the way of correcting each other. Now, we don't have um, a lot of time, and I really I have so many stones that I would love to share, but I'm not going to be able to share all of them. Uh, some of them you, you absolutely have to see by coming down here, um, because they're, they're too small to be able to, to get the effect of them. But this one I, I, I'll try to share, and again, to, to see it, you'll, you'll have to come down. But this rock is very, very special to me. I was actually cutting a stone to make some bookends, um, and it was at a time when I was really uh, verging on depression, which is not something that a Muslim should experience. Um, when you are having the depression, it, it kind of shows that, that your iman needs a major boost. Well, Allah gave mine a major boost as I was slicing this stone. And he reminded me of this ayah through this stone. So I'm going to read the ayah because it's important. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. The parable of his light is as if there were a niche and within it a lamp, the lamp enclosed in glass, the glass as it were a brilliant star, lit from a blessed tree, an olive neither of the east nor the west, whose oil is well nigh luminous, though fire scarce touched it. Light upon light, Allah doth guide whom he will to his light. And as I sliced the stone, I found within it the flame of a candle. And every time I look at this, it helps me to remember that Allah is al-Nur. He is the source of light. He is the light of light. And His light is the light that I pray will reflect through me. His light is the light that will lead us out of the darkest times. His light is the one that will keep us from ever getting lost. This other stone is actually, everyone who's seen it, it's their favorite stone. Okay, and this one speaks to the fact that Allah is all-seeing, He's all-knowing. You can't hide anything from Allah because Allah sees through everything. It talks about the illusions of life and how easily we are fooled by the illusions of life. And we'll see something, and it will not appear to be good to us, and so we'll avoid it. And we'll see another thing, and it'll look so attractive, so we go to it. And yet, with the guidance of Allah, we're able to distinguish between that is really good and that which is really not good for us. So we avoid a lot of the, the trials and tribulations that occur in our lives. And unfortunately, the only way you can see what's in this stone is going to be for you to come up and to hold it and to look up at the light and look through the stone and see what it has. It helps to remind that Allah is what breaks through the illusions of life and that Allah is the one that knows what is contained within everything. It's another little stone here which is, is really very special to me. And this one you can actually see somewhat, but again, you, you see better if you are up here. This stone is called zincite. Now, ordinarily, zincite is a dull, gray-brown, ugly, it's not attractive at all. 
Um, I've seen zinc side. I've never had the inclination to have a piece of it in my home. This particular piece of zinc side came from the smokestack of a smelting plant, you know, a plant where they melt certain kinds of stones to, to make metal, all right? Well, the, the plant was being taken apart because the pollution from it was killing everyone. It was a deadly plant and uh, it was a toxic hazard. Uh, so they were there taking it apart. And when they cut the chimney open so that they could dispose of it, they found the stone. And upon testing, because they'd never seen one like it, they discovered it was zinc site. So the young man who was working there, having met me before and heard me talk about my stones, and he's not a Muslim yet, um, he brought this stone back for me to see, and he asked me, what, well, what do you think about this stone? Well, I looked at this stone, and the first thing that came to my mind was from the worst that man can do, see what Allah can create. It reminded me that the worst amongst us today may be the best tomorrow. It reminded me that we should not judge each other because we don't know the beauty that's within the other person. And it may be that that person is truly going to be the glorious one well, we would be debased. So we are not the judge. Allah is the judge. And Allah has the power to transform each and every one of us. The Quran itself says that when the Quran enters you, it will transform you. It will change you. You will find yourself gentled. You will find yourself more peaceful. You will find yourself with an exuberance as well, with a love, with a zest for life. Because the Quran transforms you. Allah has the power to change you. Allah shows us through the guidance of the Quran how we can change ourselves to bring ourselves more in line with the way that he is designed. He teaches us how to be the best of parents. He teaches us how to be the best of friends. He teaches us about brotherhood. He teaches us about international relations, politics, everything. He teaches us how to be the best of human beings. With his guidance, we can achieve the highest level of development and achieve the highest of achievements, which would be to be in heaven. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-wadud. He is the loving. He is the definition of love. All of the love that every human being could ever have desired, wanted, or dreamed of is there for the taking. If you learn about Allah, you cannot help but love Allah. And when one loves Allah, one wishes to please the one that they love. And that is why when we teach our children the love of Allah, we teach them about Allah's love, you will find your children very eager to do that which Allah has ordered. You'll find that the salat becomes easy for the children and the fasting, and it becomes easier for you. When we talk about taqwa, We unfortunately usually stop at the lowest of definition, which is fear of Allah. And we don't take it to the higher level, which is the fear of the loss of Allah's favors. And Allah asks, and which of my favors will you deny? He asks it over and over throughout the Quran, which of my favors will you deny? We deny Allah's favors because we do not read the Quran. We do not activate the Quran in our lives, in our interactions. We do not allow the Quran to transform us 
We do not allow the Quran to transform humanity. We deny ourselves the access to the knowledge of Allah because we deny ourselves the access to the Quran. Allah is of infinite patience and unbelievable forgiveness. And we need to know that because all of us make mistakes. And sometimes we fear that the mistakes we make are so bad that we're condemning ourselves to hell and so we give up. We give up. We think, what good is it? Why should I go on? But in knowing that Allah is the most forgiving, a forgiveness that is just unbelievable, gives you the courage to continue on no matter what, because we rely on His forgiveness. We count on that forgiveness. We need that forgiveness. There's a hadith that, that speaks about after the Day of Judgment, Allah speaks to the angel Jibrail, and He says, Oh Jibrail, go to hell and bring out any anyone who has a stone's weight of faith. So Jibreel goes to hell and he brings out all of the people that have a stone's weight of faith. And Allah keeps sending him back for smaller and smaller amounts of faith until in the end he says, Oh Jibreel, go back and if they have an Adam's weight of faith, bring them out of hell. And so he goes back and he brings even an Adam's weight of faith out of hell. And there's another hadith that every time I read it, I end up crying. And this hadith says that a day will come when hell will be like a barren cornfield due to the mercy of Allah. Such mercy. Such mercy. But then he also reminds us that we must be merciful to each other. If we would have his mercy, then we should be merciful to mankind. He teaches the imam to be merciful in, in not giving long, drawn-out kutbas and to recognize when uh, the people in the congregation are tired and to cut his kutbas shorter than what maybe he had planned. To, to recite shorter passages of the Quran rather than longer one, especially when uh, old people or people with illness or, or people with little children are present. So he, he teaches little things about mercy, but he teaches us, you know, even a smile is a mercy. Yes. And if we would want Allah's mercy, then we would be merciful also. All of these things that we learn from the attributes of Allah are the things that improve us and will also tie us together as an Ummah. Allah has declared that He created us as one Ummah. It is my hope that we will begin to form that Ummah again. The only thing that has us separated at this time, seriously, set aside all the excuses, Throw every excuse you have in the trash. The only thing that separates us is that we have separated ourselves from the creator of the universe. When Allah said he had perfected our path for us, he's perfected our religion for us, he has given us the very best way of knowing him and improving ourselves. If we follow what is in the Quran, we can not fail. Now, I'm going to stop where I am. Partly because I have a flight that I have to go catch. And partly because yeah, I know that, that you have all been sitting through so, so many lectures. I want to thank you for being here not just for me, but for each other and for all of the other speakers. I thank you for caring enough 
that you want to be with other Muslims. This is a beginning. I thank you for wanting Allah in your life because it gives me hope for the future that will be. I remind you again that if there has been any, any good that has come from my presence here, that that is from Allah. And if there have been any errors, any offenses, any mistakes, that's because I'm a human being and I am not perfection. And I ask you to forgive me for any offenses or hurts or mistakes. I ask you to pray for me because I need your prayers. Your prayers are power. Allah hears every prayer. Even if you think he doesn't, he does. I ask you to verify what I've said using Quran and Sunnah to make sure that I haven't made a mistake because you are accountable for the knowledge that you have. You are personally accountable. No matter who teaches you, you must verify it in Quran and Hadith. No human being is perfect. Every human being is limited. We are limited in our capacity to understand. We are limited in our capacity to share what we do understand. We all make mistakes because we're human. The Quran is infallible. Allah is infallible. Nothing else is. Inshallah, please keep me in your prayers as we leave from here. And again, thank you. Salamu alaikum. Salamu alaikum. Alaikum assalamu wa barakatuh. I have a question. Uh, your, uh, as you call, uh, patient rock has helped me something to understand. Not just about patients as a uh, in my opinion, as I, I could saw in your rock, if uh, you had taken any rock and uh, throw the buckets of water on it, you would make nothing out of it. It wouldn't stay the same. But as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us in that same example, if drop by drop, you do make something. So it uh, helps me understand if uh, many of us, once we do dawah, we do it twice or three times and we lose patience, but uh, you cannot uh, uh, change the person's uh, mind telling him just once or twice. So if you take a, a couple of times a visit to the same person, you would make an impression on him just the Allah Azzawajal made a difference on the truck. So do you have the same thing? Yes, I, I, I see it in the very much the same way, that um, patience and perseverance is necessary for success in any aspect of our life, actually. In any aspect, whether it's your education, or whether it's in teaching, or whether it's in making changes in things. And sometimes it's, it is the small actions, the small continuous actions. Remember, even when we're taught to pray, okay? We're taught to pray first the fard. And when that is good with us, when we're comfortable with that, then we add more. But we're told not to, to overweight ourselves with more than we can do because it's the consistency and the action that's important. And, and again, this does, there's so much that you can learn. See, Allah provides so many tools to remind us. If, if the Quran itself isn't enough, there's so much, everything in nature reminds us in some way of, of the lessons that Allah is giving. And yes, in doing da'wah, slow is better. You don't go out and uh, expect to change people's mind. You know, if I give a talk, I don't expect anyone in the audience to come and take shahada. It happens sometimes, but that's rare, okay? And usually it's because they've heard me more than once <laughs> or they've heard me and then started writing to me or something like that. Um, be patient, be consistent, and be gentle little drops. 
My, my grandfather used to teach me about little bites, that the best way of doing everything was in little bites, okay? You should eat your meal, you take small bites, you don't stuff your mouth full. Why? So that you can chew and you can digest and everything. Now, when we're teaching someone about Islam, we want to give them this mountain of information in five minutes' time, shove it down their throat, expect them to, you know, chew it up, digest it, assimilate it into their bodies. And actually what it does is gag them and make them puke. So if you give them little bites, little bits of information, shui, shui, slowly, slowly, then you allow them to change one thing at a time. Again, the, the guidance um, on, on how to, to do Tao was explained first, what, you teach them about the oneness of Allah, and when this has become a part of their life, you teach them the Salat, and when this has become a part of their life, okay, the, the first thing you need to be teaching anybody is who Allah is. Teach them about Allah. You teach them about Allah and you've done everything. Because when they become aware of Allah's magnificence, of Allah's love, Allah's mercy, they want to be with Allah. Anybody would. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I think I put everyone to sleep today. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, we found a few more copies of the book for those people who didn't find giving your children the power of Islam or choosing Islam. I, I found a few more copies of them here. Um, if, if you want to be in touch with us, don't hesitate. Uh, Inshallah, we, we will make the announcement that um, at the ISNA convention and actually at, at Wartha Dean's convention as well in Chicago, we will be releasing the first ever uh, stamp, U.S. Postal Stamp, to commemorate uh, the Muslim holidays. We have uh, now an Eid stamp, and that is due to the efforts of thousands and thousands of Muslim children that participated by writing letters and drawing pictures and uh, mile-long banners and postcards and getting their parents involved in the effort and everything else. And, and our children have set an example for us when you see something that's wrong, you don't sit back and complain about it, you change it. And the children wanted the stamp, they needed the stamp, and in spite of the fact that the adult says, oh, we can't do it, they'll never do it, forget, give it up, okay? Our children persevered with the help of their mothers. <laughs> and the children achieved success in uh, actually what was considered a very phenomenal amount of time. Um, so. I encourage you to buy this stamp. It says uh, in Arabic, Eid Mubarak, and it says in English, Happy Eid. Uh, but we ask you to buy that because it, this is our first step. We fully intend to, inshallah, have Eid made a national holiday. We're moving step by step, slowly, slowly, and actually working towards Eid as a national holiday. We've already been working on this um, for about four, five, six years now. Everything takes time. Again, patience, right? And we've learned that patience uh, in, in making the change in the minds and the hearts of people. So, so please, uh, when the stamp comes out over Labor Day weekend, get to your post office, please buy them, uh, because it'll be very nice to let our children have the recognition for what they have achieved. Uh, and may Allah bless each and every one of those beautiful babies. <laughs> okay. I guess we're done, you know.